people popping in. Rosa, yeah. you could pop the question in there um, if more people are joining. Sounds good. All right, hi everyone, welcome. My name is Stephanie and I'm part of the team here at Take Me Outside. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization across Canada and our mission here is to encourage students and teachers to spend time outdoors and to really have that time as a part of their regular everyday learning. Uh, today I'm joining um, from Vaughan and I'd like to acknowledge that's part of the indigenous territory of Treaty 13. We know that in the context of outdoor learning today, it's fundamental to develop your understanding of local Indigenous knowledge and perspectives and really take that time to nurture relationships with the people who have called the place you call home for millennia. So we encourage you to consider uh, what you can do to deepen that understanding. And I think just being here today is one step in that direction. If there's any silver lining from the past two years um, being hit with the pandemic, we're excited to be able to offer these work workshops virtually and enabling these across Canada and beyond to join us, especially those who are more remote or underrepresented. Um, it's more fun when we can share the experience and our mutual desire to really develop outdoor learning together. And for those of us who are just joining, welcome again. Uh, my name is Stephanie. Quick overview of some Zoom 101. Um, everyone is automatically muted and your video has been turned off as part of the webinar formatting. Um, we are recording this session. The recording is in progress. Um, and then the structure for the presentation today, we'll have a little bit of an introduction. Um, we'll head it over to Natural Curiosity for their presentation. We'll have some time for questions and answers near the end and we'll finish it up with a prize or a couple prizes. All right. Um, so Natural Curiosity, they're here tonight and facilitating this event. Um, and they are an environmental education program from the University of Toronto Laboratory School that supports educators to embrace the outdoors as a place of learning, curiosity and reciprocity and connect to the natural world alongside their students. Natural Curiosity provides transformative professional learning and resources around its four branch environmental inquiry framework, deepened by an ind indigenous lens for thousands of educators across Turtle Island. Natural Curiosity is also giving away two copies of their uh, resource for teachers today as a prize for attending this event. So stay tuned to see if you will win that. Um, our sincere thanks to Natural Curiosity for being here and facilitating this event as part of uh, Take Me Outside Week today. Um, so thank you again. And um, the floor is yours, Haley. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. <clears throat> OK, welcome, everyone. So we'll put this Connect With Us page up at the end, or actually um, Rosa, who is my colleague who's joining us tonight, who's going to be supporting me um, with putting links into the chat. Um, but there is one of the most important links is to sign up for our newsletter, because if you sign up, we will send you a master list of all the links that we'll be sharing throughout the whole presentation. Um, so thanks to Rosa for supporting me um, so they don't have to do double duty of links plus presenting. So appreciate that. Um, so many people began by putting one word into the chat. We will be coming back to that in a moment, but if you didn't get a chance, please feel free to throw uh, one word that describes who you are into the chat. Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Haley Higdon and I'm the program director for Natural Curiosity and I am um, a guest and settler on Turtle Island and my work with the Natural Curiosity program has involved a lot of learning and unlearning that continues um, yeah, goes on and on. And I know there's still so much that I need to to learn and I'm honoring that and I try to be humble in in this idea of, of constant, continual learning and challenging my own ideas and perspectives as we move through this work. Um, so, you know, hoping that today will be um, a brave space where we can um, think about how 
um, you know, possibly as educators, we can begin to think about bringing um, and honoring Indigenous, Indigenous perspectives um, into the work that we do when we take our students outside on the land. Uh, so starting with a land acknowledgement, and if you've attended any of the natural curiosity workshops or things that we've offered, we often start with this and we love it because it was developed by children. It was developed by grade six students at the Dr. Eric Jackman Institute of Child Study Laboratory School, who were told at their graduation at the end of the year that they had to read a land acknowledgement. And they had spent the year working with the teacher librarian um, on um, learning about the true history of the this land that is now called Canada and um, they spent significant time throughout the year um, le learning and yes well unlearning as well just like I have been doing as an adult um, and so they when they saw the U of T land acknowledgement that they were to read at the beginning of their graduation they said you know what we have made um, so many more connections to what this could be we want to write something that's more meaningful to what we've learned but also challenge the adults that we're going to be in the audience to think about what a land acknowledgement sh acknowledgement should be and what it should compel us to do so it doesn't just become lip service so this is what they came up with this presentation well today but their graduation begins with the land acknowledgement because we will be using the land and need to respect this place where indigenous people have lived and continue to live. We wrote this to share some of our learning and to teach others. We thought about who would be hearing it and we didn't wanna make it too complicated or too simple. We would like to thank the first peoples of this land and all of creation, including the animals, plants, land, water, air, rocks, trees, and all that exists on this beautiful earth. Um, I'm connecting again to Carolyn's presentation today, if you attended and how much she talked about the idea of all my relations and, and thinking about the land and the animals as our relations and how that shifts your relationship um, to the land. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional territories include the land on which we gather today. The Patoon, the Wendat, Mississaugas, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and other nations whose names we no longer remember because of the impact of colonialism. We want to honor the treaties that were made with the land and between First Nations and the Crown. Treaties should be honored no matter what political party is in power. The story of Canada that most of us know is not the whole story. We've been learning from Indigenous sources about losing language and culture through residential schools, and also about ceremony, celebration, and strength of community. When we're thinking about doing something to the land like dams or pipelines, we should ask Indigenous people first because they have lived in balance with nature for thousands of years. We have lost our relationship to the earth by doing things like polluting and taking too much. We need to ask ourselves, what is more important? What I get out of this or what happens to the land? We need to think seven generations ahead. What we do today, how will that affect tomorrow? And we invite you to do the same. So I invite you all to do the same as you think about land acknowledgements with your students and, and what they can mean and asking yourself the questions, what do they compel you to do as an educator? So um, Rosa just popped into the chat um, a link that gives a bit more information about how this land acknowledgement was created. And um, this is a link to a webinar um, where Krista, who's the teacher librarian, um, who create, who helped the students create it, um, where she shares about the process of how it was developed. Okay, so welcome. Thank you so much for joining during uh, your nighttime. Totally appreciate giving up an hour to think about how we um, yeah, incorporate Indigenous perspectives into the work that we do when we take our children and students outside. So just on that note, um, Krista Spence, who I mentioned was the teacher librarian, she has helped the um, Natural Curiosity team to create um, this resource, which is a new one-pager resource um, that educators and students can use to further explore the outdoors through natural curiosity. And this is in addition to 
the two um, take me outside pin boards that that natural uh, curiosity has created on Pinterest with resources to support you with getting outside with your students. So I believe Rose is going to pop those links into the chat, but just wanted to pop that there because um, Krista, who helped the students create the land acknowledgement helped us create these. And then again, we love sharing resources of amazing organizations that are doing this work as well. And so um, this is from uh, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, but I think it's beneficial for educators across um, Turtle Island, as well as this article, Land as Teacher, Understanding Indigenous Land-Based Education from um, UNESCO. It's um, an incredible article if you have the chance to, to check it out. Um, and so just wanted to pass those along to everyone in the room to add to your resource uh, toolkit. So a little bit about natural curiosity. I'll try to go through this quickly so that um, we can dive right into the pedagogy. But um, we were launched in 2011. And as we mentioned, we are a part of the um, laboratory school that is based out of OISE U of T. And so the laboratory school works with children from nursery to grade six um, with a focus not only on skilled and knowledgeable students, but also um, environmentally and socially con conscious world citizens who also have a love of learning. And so the first edition was um, developed to support educators with incorporating environmental inquiry into their practice, because at the time, the Ministry of Education in Ontario had put out a document saying that we sh that educators should be doing this across the curriculum, um, but again, didn't provide much resources for how to actually go about it. So this resource was um, created to support that. It had a four branch framework of inquiry based learning, experiential learning, integrated learning and stewardship. And um, it um, began to make connections actually, sorry, I've got this here to Indigenous perspectives, but it just included, oh, sorry. I just moved yesterday, so things are all over the place. I apologize, but I did find it. Look at that. Um, if you have the first edition of Natural Curiosity, you may have noticed there was one paragraph linking to Aboriginal perspectives on learning. And this is where we were in our understanding as a settler organization um, in terms of how to connect to Indigenous perspectives. Um, and so since then, our understanding has grown significantly and we were pushed to create the second edition of Natural Curiosity. So we always like to say chimi gwech to the communities that helped us out with, with doing this, with thinking about how we could make a better um, edition and how we could incorporate Indigenous perspectives into a more meaningful way. So we always like to say chimi gwech to um, Aroland First Nation, to Seven Generations Educational Institute, and to Rainy River District School Board. So as a part of this learning and understanding and as to why this is important we should we that we should be doing this is this video from senator well he what he's retired now but uh, murray sinclair and you may have seen it before but um it's always impactful even if you have and many people still haven't seen it um, from the truth and reconciliation commission on the importance of education um, and educators when talking about recon, uh, reconciliation and truth. We have to learn the truth first. Hello, everybody. I'm Murray Sinclair. I'm the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the issue of reconciliation, something which, of course, is very important to us here at the Commission, but also is of interest and importance to a lot of people in Canada. One of the things that we at the Commission have discovered is that it took us a long time to get to this point in terms of the relationship between Aboriginal people in this country. Seven generations of children went through the residential schools, and each of those children who were educated were told that their lives were not as good as the lives of the non-Aboriginal people of this country. They were told that their languages, their cultures were irrelevant, they were told that their people and their ancestors were heathens and pagans and uncivilized and needed to give up that way of life to come to a different way of living. 
At the same time that that was going on, non-Aboriginal children in the non-Aboriginal school systems of this country were also being told the same thing about Aboriginal people. So as a result, many generations of children, including you and your parents, have been raised to think about things in, the, in a different way, in the wrong way, in a way that is negative when it comes to Aboriginal people. And we need to change that. It was the educational system that has contributed to this problem in this country. And it's the educational system we believe that's going to help us to get away from this. We need to look at the way that we educate children. We need to look at the way that we educate ourselves. We need to look at what it is that our textbooks say about Aboriginal people. We need to look at what it is that Aboriginal people themselves are allowed to say within the educational system about their own histories. In addition to that, we also believe that what's important when it comes to looking at the way that children are educated is to understand that because it took us so many generations to get to this point, it's going to take us at least a few generations to be able to say that we are making progress. We cannot look for quick and easy solutions because there are none. We need to be able to look at this from the perspective of where do we want to be in three or four or five or seven generations from now when we talk about the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this country. And if we can agree on what that relationship needs to look like in the future, then what we need to think about is what can we do today that will contribute to that objective. Reconciliation will be about ensuring that everything that we do today is aimed at that high standard of restoring that balance to that relationship. All right, such important words and message, especially to, to educators. Um, and connecting to that and connecting to take me outside is this quote from uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. As they traveled across the country, listening to residential school survivors, they heard this over and over again, that reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people will remain incomplete unless we are also reconciled with the earth. Okay, so reconciliation isn't just about reconciling the relationship with each other. As we heard from Carolyn Crawley, all my relations. So that involves reconciling your relationship with your non-human relatives and with the natural world. And so getting outside is the beginning of thinking about how to do that, right? Um, and making those connections and coming up with the why, why this is important to protect it. You have to fall in love with it first, the natural world. So, um, and then we also, um, our resource connects to this call to act action most specifically. Um, I attended a workshop with Pamela Toulouse, who's a Indigenous um, scholar uh, based in uh, Ontario. And she said, you know, you can have the best curriculum out there around residential schools, you know, and teaching the true history of this country. But if you don't have a focus on this call to action, building student capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect, then none of that curriculum is going to be successful. We have to focus on this first with each other and then supporting our students to have that capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy, and mutual respect. And then this article came out this summer, which is so interesting, connected to all of this as well. People who feel more connected to the natural world are more likely to support reconciliation. So again, another incredible reason to be um, creating that empathy, to be uh, supporting ourselves and students in understanding why we should be reconciling our relationship with Indigenous people, and speaking for myself as a settler, and um, why we should also be reconciling our relationship with the land. They support each other. And then again, speaking about this as a settler, I love to bring forward these words of Sheila Watt-Coultier. She says that 
moving forward, it isn't Indigenous people's sole responsibility to teach everybody about what's happening and to try to get people's attitudes to change. It's everybody's responsibility. We have to stop othering each other and start learning from one another. We all need to learn more about Indigenous knowledge, values, and principles, and how they can be replicated in dialogues and decision making, whether it's at a regional, national, or international level. So yes, I am representing this resource that brings forward an Indigenous lens as a settler. And um, part of that is to be um, unburdening, for example, Doug Anderson, the Indigenous author of the resource, to always have to be speaking and educating uh, the Canadian population about this. So um, our organization is attempting to lift the voices of Indigenous people, but also do the work as, as settlers um, and figure out what our role is within reconciliation. And that's completely connected to um, Take Me Outside and, and the work that's going on with, with that organization. So for the second edition of Natural Curiosity, we brought together <clears throat> um, an advisory board of Indigenous uh, educators and scholars. And as I mentioned, they recommended that we hire Indigenous, uh, an Indigenous author, Doug Anderson. And so we did. Um, and he uh, provided an Indigenous lens on each of the four branches from the original natural curiosity. But I just want to say this because some people say, oh, well, you know, can how different is it from the first edition? So obviously the Indigenous lenses are completely different. But we read the first draft of those lenses and we said we cannot leave the, the four branches as they were in the first edition. So we actually updated you know, the research, we um, shifted our language. As you can see, the fourth branch changed from stewardship to moving towards sustainability um, and reflecting on um, learning more about Indigenous perspectives and having a, a, a glimpse into Indigenous worldview and what that means for environmental education. And so I just wanted to share these words from Doug Anderson, because we obviously have educators joining us from all across Turtle Island. So I don't want to say that, you know, we're presenting this sort of pan-Indigenous perspective. Um, but, but what Doug has done, um, well, I'll just read his words to sort of explain, um, explain this, um, the model, the pedagogy. So he says, reducing Indigenous perspectives to simplistic terms is problematic. Even leading Indigenous elders, scholars, and knowledge keepers cannot be expected to always agree on particulars. However, with this in mind, commonly agreed upon qualities of most, if not all, Indigenous perspectives include four things. So he has connected these four um, perspectives to each of the four branches. So the first one he has connected um, is a strong sense of spirituality. And sorry, that's my two-year-old crying in the background, if you're wondering. <laughs> I apologize, everyone, um, but that's life. Um, a strong sense of spirituality. He's connected to um, inquiry and engagement and has called it lighting the fire. The second is a deeply rooted sense of place. He has connected that to the fourth branch of experiential learning, and he has called it sending out roots. Um, the third perspective is a recognition that everything is related, so all my relations, and has, Doug has connected that to the third branch, integrated learning, and has called it the flow of knowledge. And then um, the fourth commonly agreed, upon, agreed upon quality of most, if not all indigenous perspectives, um, the fourth perspective is an emphasis on reciprocity. And Doug has connected that to the fourth branch, which is moving towards sustainability. And he has titled it Breathing with the World. So we'll talk a little bit about those four branches as we move forward together. So I always forget to tell people um, to, if you can take a moment to grab a piece of paper, a scrap piece of paper. Um, this is just something, and, and if you've joined a workshop before, you've probably done this already, but it's okay because I think every time I do it, 
you know, things shift for me. Um, if you don't have a piece of paper near you, don't worry. It's about the process, not the product. So you can um, just imagine in your brain, okay? Um, and I can't see you all because we're doing the, the, work, the uh, webinar style. So, um, so no worries. So if you have your piece of paper, um, we're doing something called the tree activity or the tree experience. So the first branch of natural curiosity is um, inquiry and engagement. And it used to be called inquiry-based learning in the first edition, but we added engagement to focus on this idea that student engagement is an integral part of the inquiry process. So when the first edition of came out, not many people were talking about inquiry. That doesn't mean that people weren't doing it, right? Like semantics within education. But we found as more and more people were um, beginning to think about how they in could incorporate in inquiry into their practice, um, sometimes this piece about engagement as well as collective knowledge building, um, sometimes that sort of got forgotten or missed. So. Um, Carolyn Crawley today was talking about this focus on the individual and individual success. And we see that so often within our education system as well. And so we like to talk about collective group knowledge building that supports every student within your room growing their understanding about a topic not just the individual success of one student or two students in your classroom. So um, there is more information about uh, group knowledge building. Um, unfortunately, in this context, we can't do it together, but I do really encourage you to um, check out what it's all about. And Rosa, if you get a chance, you can also throw a video of students doing um, a group knowledge building session so that uh, the educators in the room can see what it's all about. So Doug has brought in this idea of lighting the fire. How do we spark the fire within all of our students so that they feel inspired, they feel engaged, they feel connected? And one way to do that is to ask them to bring who they are, to bring a connection to their family, to bring a connection of their, their passion, um, what sparks their interest to the learning. So that's what this little tree activity is meant to be. So on the front, if you've got your piece of paper, I'm gonna give you maybe 10 seconds to draw a tree. Okay. I don't know about you, but in Ontario right now, it's apple picking season. So when I ask this around apple picking season, this is what most people's tree look like, looks like. Um, you know, it depends where, where you are, right? Like this is, this is an example of how the local context would inspire what kind of trees people were, were drawing, right? Um, as we get into winter or people from more northern Ontario or depends where you are, you know, they might draw an ever, some kind of evergreen. Um, I, we had somebody joining a workshop recently from Hawaii and I'm like, I'm pretty sure your tree probably doesn't look like this or this. And of course she had drawn a, a palm tree. So, you know, didn't give you much time to draw this tree. Didn't really ask you to bring any of any part of who you are or any part of your connection to a tree to the work. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is open up this piece of paper and you can use the whole piece of paper um, you can draw, you can write, you can close your eyes and reflect, whatever, whatever works best for you as a learner. And I want you to think about a tree that means something to you. Think about a tree that you've spent time with. Think about a tree that knows you best, right? Thinking about flipping that relationship. What tree knows you best? And take a moment, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to a minute maybe, um, to either draw, write about, or just sit back and think about that tree.
Okay, so this uh, Rosa just popped a link into the chat sharing about an educator who joined a workshop um, of natural curiosities, maybe two, actually had to be more than that, because my son's two. So two and a half, three years ago, maybe. Um, and she just recently wrote a blog uh, reflecting on that question, what tree knows her best. So that was the link that Rosa just popped in in the chat. And so we don't really have a chance to share our stories with each other in person or in a breakout room, but um, that's what we would probably do next if we were in a in a room together is I would ask you to share if you felt comfortable because it actually can be an emotional process for for many people but um, if you were comfortable to share the story of your tree and if you do feel comfortable um, you can you know share a short version of that in the chat if you if you would like um, but this experience was actually created by the senior kindergarten teacher at the lab school who was doing an inquiry on trees with her students and she sent this question home to the families and um, you know they had the students her children would draw the tree and then had a parent sort of transcribe the story of that tree and she learned so much about her students and about her the families of her students and it just really shows the difference like we kind of like to joke that this is the bulletin board where everybody's art looks exactly the same versus actually talking about and sharing our connections our relationships to uh, the natural world to trees and how that brings our hearts and who we are to to the learning um, so yeah if anyone wants to pop in the story of their tree into the chat I invite you um, to do so um, I am actually sitting in a room looking out into the backyard um, of my childhood home and I said I just recently moved um, back into this house but there is a white pine that was planted when I was a child that was about yay big. Um, and now it is taller than the house. Um, so I've watched that tree grow throughout my life um, and I'm sitting looking at it right now. So I'd probably share the story of, of that tree. Um, if I could, well, I guess I can share, I am sharing it. <laughs> But I encourage you to share the story of your tree um, in the chat if you feel comfortable. So Doug just extends this when he says that inquiry based learning reflects a simple, profound truth that learning is most powerful when rooted in the heart. The heart is our connection to spirit, which in turn is what unifies all things. The heart is the seat of the fire igniting our whole being. And so just bringing in those words to connect to this idea of heart-based learning. How do we provide that <clears throat> for our students? So the, the learning is meaningful and they can also share their hearts in connection to their relationship with the natural world. So moving on to the second branch of natural curiosity um, it is experiential learning and Doug has titled it sending out roots. And so when we think about um, experiential learning, if we did word association and I said that to you, most of you um, would probably say, oh, hands on, right? And hands on experiences in the outdoors are so essential um for all students and we know this there's so much research behind this right um but what we like to share is the importance of also connecting this to minds on right so yes you know you can definitely have ex un unplanned experiences outside um but that we also do need some times where we're reflecting back on those experiences and maybe what what unexpected thing happened and what did we learn that we didn't think we were going to learn, um, you know, how it helped us with our mental health. And so just making sure that we're making those connections as a community. So we grow our learning and understanding together. And then so we've got our um, hands on, we've got our minds on, and then also bringing in what we just talked about, our hearts on. And when all that happens, um, I love this quote from Natural Curiosity, and I've heard this anecdotally from so many educators. When they take their students outside, the students that don't necessarily achieve success 
in a conventional classroom, all of a sudden they are the leaders when we get outside or all of a sudden they don't say anything inside the four walls of a classroom, but all of a sudden you're hearing their voice when you bring them outside or you're seeing an expertise that they have that you would never have seen if you didn't give this opportunity for them. And so we have to provide all different ways for all of our students to achieve success and taking students outside and learning on the land is going to allow for that. So this quote is from Natural Curiosity on page 72. In free exploration in nature, cultural and learning differences tend to find a comfortable place. The child who is challenged by the confinement of a classroom takes leadership in building a dam. Verbal skills no longer assume priority. And I wanna say written skills as well. Um, there is nothing more powerful than free individual exploration within a group of equally engaged peers for strengthening a child's sense of community. And how important is that, right? We need to reconnect to creating community, going back to that call to action, 63, number three, right? Creating intercultural understanding, mutual respect and empathy. And that's how we do that. So Doug, these are his words talking about this. We're taking steps towards Indigenous understanding when we take students outside and provide opportunities for them to use all their senses to make fundamental connections with as many aspects of the world around them as recommended in NC. An Indigenous approach challenges us to ask, how do we deepen our relationship with the place we are in? How do we send out roots? And so we've got this little video. We're only going to watch a little bit of it um, because these educators' stories are actually in the back of Natural Curiosity. So when they start talking about the white rabbit inquiry, I'm going to pause there and, and um, you can actually take a look in the resource um, if, you, if you've got it or you can get your hands on it um, to read their, their story. Um, but we like sharing this because these students are now in grade four. And we're talking about this idea of sending out roots, connecting to place. So they connected to this place in kindergarten. And we have heard from these educators that, that we have a connection to, that these students have advocated to go back out to this place in grade one, in grade two, in grade three. And I sure hope that they're still doing that in grade four and they're convincing their teachers to allow them to have this continual connection to this place. We like our camp. And what do you like about it? Uh, I like our toy trail. Okay, huh? uh, I, I like the new trail. The, the new, new trail? trail. Yeah. Oh, we're going to try that one today. Usually, when we first arrive, we sit in our little area here where we have picnic table and some benches, and we spend just a short little bit of time talking about a, a topic right now. We're doing birds, so we're talking about their nests and the different kinds of birds and if we can hear birds. What kind of birds? Chickadees. Chickadees. What else? Well, we had heard through a friend that if you put yarn, colored yarn down on the ground in the spring, that the birds will use that to build as part of their nests. So we had done an inquiry into birds and, and their nests and just investigated what their nests are all made out of. We decided, okay, springtime, let's try that. So all the kids put colored pieces of yarn all over the trails and all over the camp. And over a couple of weeks, all the yarn had disappeared. Bird nests are hard to find. So um, anyway, it so happened. We were just lucky, I guess. But the tree that's in the middle of our camp has a nest in it with a blue piece of yarn in it. So it actually happened, we were so happy. But it was like about right here, stuck in there. We kind of stuck to the two trails that are close on either side of the road. But we have a third trail that's marked with blue ribbon that goes up on a huge rock there. 
and down the other side. Oh, a bridge! Put it forward, Yeah, that's the castle right there with the moat. I keep looking at it every day. Yeah, we see it lost, but we don't think of it as a castle anymore. Now I'm going to show you my favorite tree. My tree color. It has red and red is my favorite color. I think you need to have things like the bird feeders we've got up. Yeah. Yeah. So really interested in, in the plants, the and little animals, and it uh, sparks their interest in math or science. Oh, these are blueberries. Do not step on them. It was one one late late fall and there had been no snow like it, it was like almost the end of november and no snow and we were hiking on that trail over there near the castle and somebody saw something white and thought oh it's a garbage bag they just kept watching it and then it started to move so, so i'm going to pause it there um because their story about the white rabbit the inquiry into the white rabbit and why uh, rabbits change color in the winter time. Um, um, it's being told, or uh, Marge and Sarah have told the story in the back of, of Natural Curiosity. Um, but yeah, just wanted to share that video and share that um, those students' connection to that place. And we have heard um, some constructive feedback, which we're always willing to receive, that you should not be leaving synthetic materials like yarn out for the birds. Um, but again, hopefully you can see that despite that, these students have a very deep connection to this place. But what I also want to quickly share is that there's a story in the back of Natural Curiosity from an educator named Stephanie. And she works in downtown Toronto. And she talks about how, you know, she um, and her students also form a deep connection to um, a place that is just about a maybe it ends up being a 10 minute walk you know so she starts with her kindergarten students just going around the yard and then around the community and then down into a local Toronto ravine and so that this is I just want to say that that this is possible um, even if you don't have access to the kind of nature that you saw in this video. And so the third branch is called integrated learning and the flow of knowledge. And I know um, as an educator myself, um, if I was before reading uh, Doug Anderson's words about integration, um, I would have thought that integration means more about, okay, how do I incorporate some math, some science, some art into a unit that I was doing or even into an inquiry that I was doing. Um, but as you heard um, um, from both the Indigenous presenters today, that, that integration is um, such a bigger understanding of how we integrate our family, how we integrate our community, how we integrate all our relations, all our non-human relations into the learning that we do, and also how we think from a seven generational perspective and how do we integrate that into the learning that we do for ourselves and also with our students. So this question is connected to that. What would be different if we lived with a strong sense that water, land, all the world around us are relatives? What if we love the world around us deeply as our family? Our actions would then begin to reflect reciprocity in how we live and move in any direction, including seven generations into the future. So connecting that to Carolyn's words today, connecting that to Murray Sinclair's words about thinking about the impact that that seven generations of, of residential schools have had on Indigenous people um, in Canada, but also the impact that we can have as educators moving seven generations into the future and shifting um, uh, um, the perspective of the students that we work with, and then also all of their connections. 
So there is no ending to integrating school subjects once we allow the integrity of all knowledge to flow like water through any aspect of our immediate place. More beautiful words um, from Dag Anderson about the power of integration. So if we were all together, I would have us all stand up right now. Um, and I actually was um, shared, this experience was shared with me in Winnipeg, um, probably like obviously pre-pandemic from an Indigenous um, educator there. And when I started talking about integration and seven generational perspectives, she said, okay, we got to do this. I just, someone just, just showed me this and I, I want to show you now. So imagine we are all in a room together. And I would ask one person to volunteer to represent a child. And somebody would volunteer. <laughs> um, might take a little, like, you know, encouragement. And that person would go and stand at one end of the room facing the wall. And then I would say, okay, who, what it, who does it take to make that child? And so we'd have parent one and parent two. I'd ask two more volunteers to go stand behind that child facing the child. Okay, so we have generation one, generation two. Then I would ask, okay, what does it take to make these two people? Okay, so we get two more people to go and stand behind those people facing, um, facing the backs of, of um, the second generation. So we would have first generation, second generation, third generation. Then we would continue, right? We've got some math being integrated here. And I wasn't, how, I, I wasn't sure how many people would be in the room tonight, right? But, you know, if we had 31 people, we would only make it to, you can see here, first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation. And obviously, I think we have about 50 people in the room. Um, and so we wouldn't even make it again to... Um, you know, sixth or seventh generations. And so I, before doing this, I had never really pictured what it meant when we talk about um, seven generational perspective. And so we would ask that person who was the child to, you know, think about all the people that were standing behind them. Um, and those are people are representing their ancestors, the people that it took to create them. And then we would ask the child to also turn around and face them and think about their impact moving forward seven generations into the future. And you can think about that even from the perspective of a teacher and the impact that you can have on students moving seven generations into the future. So prior to, to having that experience, um, I had never really thought about it. And then that's just thinking about our human relatives. If we bring in um, the idea of all my relations, then that is even more powerful. So the fourth and final branch, moving towards sustainability. Um, again, I did mention at the beginning that this used to be called stewardship. <clears throat> and we changed it because from a Western perspective, stewardship can imply a hierarchical relationship with the land. And Carolyn talked about this. What words that we have in English that define a connection to the land, right? And so stewardship. Um, can be one of them. And I have heard many Indigenous people who say we are stewards of the land, but when that's said, I think it, it, it has a different definition than if you were to look up what a steward is in the English language. And so we just wanted to shift away from that because it's kind of implies that we are acting on the earth. We are, you know, making the earth better. We are healing the earth, which is a great thing, but it's separating ourselves from nature. It's not thinking about ourselves in relationship to the land. It's thinking about how we can heal it versus how we are actually a part of it. And so Doug brings these words forward. He says, practicing reciprocity means more than just stewardship of the environment, as if nature were something apart from humans. 
if we do not help our children grow into an awareness that expands beyond our usual modern notions of nature, we leave them with superficial survivor tools for the future. Saving nature as an outsider to nature, a thing from which we are alienated, be, um, becomes a daunting and hopeless burden. And so just to share a little example of this, so I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Um, sorry about that, is um, this is a picture just outside of the laboratory school where natural curiosity is housed. And after reading this branch on um, reciprocity and breathing with the world, we had to rethink some of the activities and experiences that we did around Earth Day. So something that happened for years at the school was the PTA bought pansies and the children planted, planted them, um, which is a, you know, a beautiful activity. They're getting their hands dirty, they're outside, they're working together. But when we sort of talked about the why and talked about this new understand, new to us, definitely not new on Turtle Island, um, but uh, this idea of actually creating a long-term reciprocal relationship to the land, um, we decided to do things differently. And so you can see here, these are the senior kindergarten children digging up the hostas. They did go home with families to plant in their gardens. So we didn't just throw out these relatives to plant new ones, but we um, decided to work with an indigenous gardener to replant the front area of the school with local and native species, as well as this front area plant with um, working with Doug Anderson and other indigenous partners to plant um, traditional medicines of sage and sweet grass, as well as tobacco. And Krista Spence, who's standing in the uh, middle here holding the, the book, this is actually the, the, the next September uh, doing professional development for the staff at the lab school. We are reading Braiding Sweetgrass and we are getting everybody to stuff their face into the sweet grass because if you haven't smelt it, well, you're missing out. But um, Krista has worked with Doug Anderson and other Indigenous partners and with the children to harvest this medicine so that, um, you know, when we are able to invite local partners back to our school community. Um, we have uh, medicines to offer back in reciprocity um, to our partners who continue to teach us as a school community. And so just sharing that as an example of shifting to reciprocity versus just sort of an act of stewardship on, you know, for example, Earth Day, like let's plant a tree, which again is a great act, but how do we think about actually forming a relationship with that tree? So just quickly going back to the one word that describes who you are. And so this question um, was asked in a research study, and they asked many different communities coming from many different places around the world to answer this question. And four types of answers uh, came about. The first type of answer was people describing themselves as an individual. So we saw this, you know, curious, um, uh, you know, indecisive, like I said. Um, so, you know, many people responded in that way. And that's, that's totally fine. The second type of answer was um, a relational answer. And then we saw some of those people. I think some people said a mom, a teacher. So describing themselves in relationship to some, someone else. The third was how people were feeling in the moment. So, you know, people are feeling hungry or tired or in a frenzy, I think somebody said. Um, so how they were feeling in the moment. The fourth was actually an ecological identity. I am fire, water, tree. And the study found that people who gave this kind of, this fourth kind of answer lived in closer relationship to the natural world. And many of these people were indigenous that shared an ecological identity. 
And so, you know, we're not saying that one answer is better than the other, but I think, you know, in, in connecting to this idea of all my relations that, that, that Carolyn shared today, we need to think about um, understand, beginning to understand an Indigenous worldview and also thinking about how we define ourselves in connection to the natural world. So I'm going to give you a chance. Um, oh, I just see the screen is blank. Is that for everybody? Um, but if you have a chance, I'd like you to share um, if you have redefine yourself. If you were to think about your connection, your ecological connection, how would you define yourself with that connection in mind? So feel free to pop that um, new way to define yourself in the chat. So just a brief summary of the four branches. I see I'm running out of time. Just wanna share as I have already, there are educator stories in the back of, their, of the book, sharing practice, seeing this in action. Just wanna end with these words that indigenous perspectives cannot be deeply reflected in a written document or outside of their cultural context. All that can be provided in the natural curiosity resource are some indications of how such perspectives can inform environmental inquiry. The living and moving spirits of students, educators like yourselves, and communities are needed for transforming awareness over time into understanding, knowledge, and eventually wisdom. Okay, so please join our mailing list um, we'll be sharing all, a list of all the resources um, that were shared today, um, as well as others, and, and then you'll be on our list to get our newsletter. Um, there are um, ways to connect with us. Rosa will pop those into the chat again if you're into social media, because we do post a lot of um, resources on there. Um, here's some, yeah, the, we mentioned the newsletter. We do have a webinar series as well. And we did mention our free pin boards and we have um, two that are focused on Take Me Outside Day. And um, yeah, check out our new, we have got a new one working in collaboration with um, uh, two teacher librarians to support us in creating this. And as well, mentioning again, our new NC resource for Take Me Outside Week. We can pop that in there. And more about our webinars. And you can join our Facebook group, just throwing a lot at you right now. And thank you all, Chimi Gwech, for joining us for tonight. I think it's exactly eight o'clock. Um, I know I'm sorry there wasn't a chance for questions, but I'm fine to stick around if any of those pop up or please feel free um, to email us and um, get in contact and hopefully we can, um, we can connect. That's great. Thank you so much, Haley. That was um, super informative, a great presentation. And I feel that you've brought up so many good points that really highlight how Indigenous knowledge is a valid way of knowing and how it really separates us, gets us away from that Western way of thinking. And, Kind of helps us think outside of the box. So you left us a lot to think with tonight. So thank you for that. Oh yeah, I um, forgot there are prizes. Stick around, people. Yeah, <laughs> there are prizes. So that great resource that Haley uh, took us through. Um, again, Natural Curiosity will be giving away two copies of that. So we're going to get to that shortly. But I just also wanted to comment on, you know, by being here tonight and being part of these conversations, we're really honoring our commitment to those 94 calls of actions for the truth and reconciliation. And I know it might seem like a huge task and it is only getting started, but it's important that we do this together and by taking small steps first. So those small steps include, you know, things like just being here tonight and attending workshops, signing up for the newsletters and exploring different resources, um, any resources that you can. Um, so as Haley mentioned, you can, um, if you have a question for her, um, it is past eight o'clock now, but she, it's going to stick around for a little bit longer if you did have something to ask you can pop that in the chat um, and i'd like to take this opportunity now just before we get to our prizes to thank our partners natural curiosity of course for being here tonight facilitating this event with us um, for your resources and your generous prizes and your continued support through taking the outside week um, also here we have canada's nonprofit outdoor learning store with us tonight and there we'd like to thank them for their continued support during Take Me Outside day and week. 
Um, the outdoor learning store offers supplies for teachers to help them get their students outside. And uh, you'll be able to check them out in, on the link in the chat. So thank you again for your generous prizes and your support throughout the entire week. Thanks to MEC as well for their continued support and their link is in the chat as well if you'd like to check, check them out. All right, so for prizes, um, Haley, if you wanted to uh, go ahead and uh, give away one of the um, natural curiosity resources. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> I've got to choose. Okay, I'm just going to do like a scroll super fast and then the first name that comes up. Okay. Uh, is it Roxanne Broad or Brody Road? And when I just scroll down, that was the first name that, that came to the top. So hopefully they're still here and they should be because, okay, I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to scroll. Whoa. Okay, uh, I think it's uh, Bansi Meta. I apologize if I didn't pronounce both those names correctly. Perfect. And you'll have our TMO info at email sent in the chat now. Um, so please get in touch with us to claim your prizes. So that's great. Thank you, uh, Haley. And then we have one other prize from Taking Outside. It is a swag package, which includes a t-shirt and an outdoor journal. Um, and that is going to Rachel Schmidt. So again, uh, congratulations. And uh, you have your our contact info in the chat. So please get in touch with us to claim your prizes. All right, thank you everyone for attending our session tonight. Um, we look forward to seeing you for our other events throughout the week. Tomorrow we have an Olympic athlete panel. We have some yoga sessions tomorrow. And tomorrow evening, we have another educator workshop with Great Minds Think Outside um, at six o'clock PM Eastern time. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, Rosa.